tides of decay dismember mankind. How they are swept away again and again from those lofty moorings of the spirit which encourage men to seek the portals of heaven even while below the glitter and glamour of outer world consciousness seems to present to their being a treasure incomparable. We who understand the precious sparkling diadems of spiritual magnetism are well aware that there is indeed no comparison between mortality and immortality, but those wedded to mortality who see through the lens and screen of mankind's imperfection are again and again dashed upon the rocks and shoals of mortal numbness. We come then to awaken mankind from the lethargy of the senses and to call to their attention that the will of God is good, that it is a charge of radiance from afar that draweth nigh unto the heart and to the mind to create therein response to the ministrations of the deity, the master potter who molds the clay, that he may deify it and make of the clay creation the creative manifestation of himself. Let men then be aware that out of the darkness comes forth a great light because the light has the power to expand into the darkness and to show forth therein that life is teeming with abundance because God is. Because God is, you are. And because you are and because God is, reality is born and the sunburst of that first flash of consciousness in the domain of the individual is the doorway to great opportunity. But when it is lightly cast aside for the baubles and trinkets of life, what think ye the lords of karma say when they peruse the record of the individual and find that again and again he has expressed preference for outer world conditions? Shall we then find some measure of recompense that will allow us to grant unto mankind renewed opportunity when his pathway is strewn with rejected opportunities again and again. I cite then the responsibility of individuals to peruse for themselves the eternal records and understand by reading those precious records how that there are no outer circumstances that are not governed by the law of man's being. Mankind again and again profess that they desire to expand the wisdom of their own God intent and again and again turn toward the outer conditions as though they were real and reject the internal security of the pole star of their being as though it were unreal. I then, El Moria, Chohan of the first ray, bearing dedication to the great will of God, carry forth to you this day the God feeling of eternal security which comes from that peace and goodwill which is born from the heart of God. This is reality. It is the reality of the divine revelation which pulls back the covering curtains and veils man has created over the face of nature, revealing the wonderful kingdom of nature as God's own. And ye as a part thereof find no longer that nature is a raging, roaring thing seeking to devour you but that over which ye were given originally divine dominion. Divine dominion to command the wind and the waves and to say, peace be still and behold as nature obeys. This is the dominion of the Christed ones. It is the dominion of those who have sought and found 
their own God reality and have understood the need for constancy of expression to pursue the divine path until it becomes the only tangible reality of existence. When men do this, they are not bereft of the tides of grace. They are not covered by shrouds of darkness. But we have cracked the cosmic egg and the sunlight of the eternal presence shines through. Cognition of the will of God is the forte then of the God-realized man. And they that dwell in outer darkness where there is gnashing of teeth and pain, where banality and unhappiness hold sway, must understand that this occurs because they have permitted it. We know that man does not have the strength to be able to resist evil, except he draw that strength from the divine source. But there is no excuse for man permitting himself to be cast beyond the pale of spiritual existence into the domain of encrusted insecurity of mortal thought and feeling with its constant round of ceaseless struggles for existence and happiness. God lives, and he lives in you, but you must nourish the seeds of his flame and the memory of his covenant in a greater measure by far than you have accepted the crushing burden of the world and the sense of the world. Yet it is to the world that men turn as though it were real. And it is from God that men turn as though he were unreal. Thus long ago, when it was the desire of the great lords of karma to teach mankind and through a living teacher, and when the selection was made in the theosophical order of Mr. Krishnamurti, it was to expound the ideal of the real as opposed to the false. Unfortunately, they were able to captivate and confuse that precious soul. And so once again, the powers of darkness that sought to sift as wheat were able to express through an advocate qualities of untruth in refutation of the great tides of ascended master truth and law which came forth in the original at the feet of the master. So it has been down through the centuries when thundering from great heights came the tomes of immortal life that individuals have been sifted as wheat and men have pointed at them as a thing upon the side of the pit and they have said there stands or lies Lucifer. This is understandable for the kingdom of God is a prize, the greatest prize that can come to any and therefore the dangers are great and the pitfalls many, but the world are not consumed by their own fashions for they are a part of that sea of slime which engulfs hearts and turns them from the great tides of cosmic reality. Those who are a part of it do not seem at all to be enmeshed in struggle or within the framework of reference that is their own Lilliputian world, they live and die as mice and men, playing out the small dramas of their individual expressions as though it were a cosmic drama of great moment. But when the eyes of God are upon them, they are not reckoned among the living, for they are dead already in trespasses and sins, trespassing against the reality of their own life. Not a trespass against the deity as the deity is a thing apart from man, 
but a trespass against the deity that is a part of man. For life is God and every expression thereof is intended to be a total manifestation of his victory and happiness and God's success. When men fall short then of the great cosmic mark and prize, it is always a pity that comes to themselves as they recognize out of the dregs of self-pity that they have failed and have fallen short of the mark. There is no need then to lament this condition so long as consciousness is able to assess itself. For when consciousness assesses that it has fallen short of the mark, the first step that the individual must do is clear. They must arise as the prodigal son and say with firm determination, I will return unto the house of my father. Are they tired of the husks and dregs of life? then let them return to where reality lives and abides forever. Let them turn from the vomit of human wretchedness unto the security of the Christ domain. There is no need whatsoever for men to remain in a state of wretchedness, for God lives every moment, and mankind themselves stand behind the curtain of their own self-rejection facing a small circle of insecurity, of wrong thought, of wrong feeling, of misuse of energy, of slovenliness in action, and of disquietude which they sometimes unfortunately desire to spread unto their fellow men. For it is often true that individuals caught in the jaws of the trap of their own mortal consciousness will actually seem to derive some benefit from spreading their own insecurity out into the world of form and subverting others into their own state of decrepitude. More is the pity, you say, and we echo those sentiments, but again we affirm that God lives, and he lives for those who have rejected themselves and their own immortal reality, as well as for those who have passed beyond the veil to their God victory. God lives for all, and he lives in all, and his will is for the freedom of all, and his will is for the victory of the earth over all of her disaffection, disloyalty, and non-recognition of the great truth that is the will of the eternal. I come to you then this day with renewed determination that the purposes of this age envisioned by God for man shall be fulfilled. We will not take our stance based upon the disillusionment of men. We will take our stance based upon the divine intent. Maximize, maximize, maximize the divine intent. Minimize, minimize, minimize the human disaffection. Won't you please be seated? The Eternal Father, in his great majesty of purpose, has this day recalled from the planet Earth the nine ambassadors that were here in order to perform a specific service for hierarchy. Some of those who are in physical embodiment will remain in physical embodiment, but their mission has been recalled. The hierarchy has made a renewed determination to fulfill the obligations of the hierarchy toward the deity. And they have decided to refuse to accept the outer issues 
joined by mankind in contradiction to the eternal perfection of the divine plan. The full meaning of this may not dawn upon some of you for a period, and others may grasp it with instant grasp. But the meaning of it I will elucidate in part, that you may have hope of a more instant grasp. And I say this to you all. While it is true that the mind of God has never fallen from its highest state, the hierarchy as a part of the eternal Holy Christ presence, acting as a mediator between God and man, has from time to time acted in the world of form in order to report various episodes that were taking place upon the planet whereby man has actually, in one sense of the word, manipulated the responses of heaven to his own activities. This, of course, was a part of the wisdom of hierarchy themselves, acting under divine inspiration. But now it has been decided for a time, a time, a time, and a half a time that we shall try it with the will of God acting supreme, tempering no more than the cosmic tides to the shorn lamb of man's identity in its state of evolutionary perceptions, we shall bring forth the great cosmic truth to the planet by the love tides gushing forth from the heart of the living presence of God. This means that the will of God shall saturate every rock and tree. It means the creation of the eternal radioactivity from the very core in the center of the earth in Pelur's domain, through the air and atmosphere, and all about you, so that the presence of God in its heavenly aspects shall manifest below in a measure inconceivable to the mind of man now. And this, while it manifests in the time constant, in the spatial time continuum, shall also come about with a quick slant toward manifestation, but in order to preserve life upon the planet withal. For it shall be by divine decree, and the science of heaven shall be used. We are not then concerned any longer with man's reactions to the ministrations of heaven, but we are prepared to assist those life streams who have decided within the force field of their own heart and being in full faith that they will embrace the cosmic will of God and determine that they will express it, that to them we shall give the ministrations of the immortality of the infinite God. We shall give the fullest measure of our attention to life. We shall give it to the elementals. We shall give it everywhere. And swift reaction may indeed occur below to that which men do. For when in the presence of heaven as heaven is all around mankind bursting round their feet, we shall see just how long they shall resist that pressure. In time past, embodied mankind, even the holy innocents, were subverted by this awful manifestation of the Luciferian hordes and the powers of darkness that this planet played host to, but now we deal at impersonal levels, not with embodied mankind, but with the presence of the Holy Spirit for descending from the heart of the Lord Mahachohan and through the Mahachohan, this dispensation is given. And the planet then shall receive the impersonal radiation of Almighty God. Let none fear it. Let all revere it, and let all see it as a boon to the aspiring sons of God and the God-determination of the cosmos to respond 
to the innocent of heart who seek to find in this day and age freedom from the overpowering manifestations of outer world conditions. The hierarchy has spoken. As the Chohan of the first ray, I have given this dispensation to you this day. It is an epoch that has ended, and it is an epoch that is beginning. It is the dawn of a millennium of hope, and it is for all men, but those who desire to express the deity, to walk as living Christs among men, they shall be its benefactors. And to the rest, not because we wish it, but because it is a side effect of the lifting of the cosmic emissaries and hosts devoted to God from the earth will come about the manifestation of that which will produce those cries, let the rocks fall upon us and let the everlasting caves cover us. Or there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth as mankind reap that which they have sown. But in the world, the banner of hope shall fly. The banner of every retreat of the great white brotherhood shall fly its flags. Its banners shall wave in the breezes of the Holy Spirit. And light shall burst as the sun in its splendor as 10,000 suns under the planet. And new hope shall fill the heart chalices of the faithful and it shall be a resurgent filling, the cup of Christ's magnificence, the grail most holy. The position of the devotee and the chila shall then be one of recognition of the higher, of hourly attunement with the higher, of understanding that the kingdom of God draweth nigh unto the earth, and we shall no longer be concerned with the darkness, for the darkness is far spent. The darkness is far spent. The darkness is far spent. And the day spring from on high is at hand to visit mankind in their affliction as pilgrim's progress looms before those who yearn to do, to know the will of God, to be Christ among men, humble as those who are born in a manger, but who are piloted by the star that came forth as Nova from Cosmos heart. I thank you.
spacious ones. Away in a manger, no place for his head. These words from the hymn do remind mankind today who meditate upon it that there seems to be little room in the inn of mankind's being for the head of man's being, which is Christ. The radiance of the pure white light is a tangible manifestation and is no imagination or any state of not being. Rather, it is a state that is akin to immortal being, to realization of the fullness of that which shall be when the darkened manifestations of men in this present hour have long since ceased to be and the dying struggles of this age are no more. We who have observed by his grace through the centuries the burning desire in the hearts of the faithful for a greater measure of Christ communication and understanding are aware today that there is a struggle in the being of man for his own spiritual heritage, that he might come to a state of consciousness that belies all that he has done of a carnal sort. For today, the world, as in centuries past, continues unabated in an activity of continual struggle with one another, the rounds of this struggle are, historically speaking, a manifestation of war builded upon war. And the Prince of Peace and the message thereof is frequently even used as a measure of excuse for mankind's crusading forth to do the will of God. In reality, men are often schooled in a state of consciousness where they know not nor are aware of the realities of God considering those realities to be figments of some men's idle imaginations as the dying manifestations of a bourgeois culture. This, of course, to the hearts of the faithful is an intolerable thought. And men and women who are familiar with the bonds of the cosmic Christ and who know the tangible reality of heaven can never accept the communistic and atheistic doctrines. Yet I call to mankind's attention today that there is a most insidious and deliberate plan, a plot of far-reaching dimensions that has crossed the lines of race and creed of politics, of religion, and even of science to cause a wedding of sorts to be made between various discordant elements, negative elements, as it were, of these diverse manifestations. This wedding of negative elements for a purpose is often invisible and not perceived on the surface of life, and therefore the whole manifestation of world negativity sometimes manifests in positive forms and men not knowing the nature of their deeds because they work in the dark in the darkened realm of mortal personality are from time to time embroiled in an activity that doeth great despot to their brothers upon the planetary body in fact precious ones of the light Many today who are zealots in the communist realm are sincere workers to produce good for their fellow men. They are atheistic in their consciousness but devoted to the idea of world humanitarianism and it is time that individuals recognize this 
so that they do not lump together all of the people in the world who are communists or who are, for example, Chinese or Negroes or white people or any race, creed or color or political affiliation so that mankind accepts that a certain segment of humanity is of little value and indeed is a negative manifestation when in reality there are segments of segments and men must learn to discern the deeds that men do and not to classify mankind in masses that they themselves categorize and bring despot to within the folds of their consciousness, thus harming themselves as well as their fellow men. Now in connection with the communists who are devoted to world good, let me call to the attention of mankind throughout the planetary body that neither capitalism nor communism have the approval of the ascended masters. What I wish to call to your attention is that what has the approval of the ascended masters is a golden rule order where the nature of mankind is served by the power of the light from within one heart extending to another heart where each part of life seeks to benefit another part of life and all work together for a universal manifestation of Christ's good to the family of nations. This cannot be brought about where there are manifestations of extreme poverty, whether or not the individuals responsible for this are actually the people who are themselves victims of this awful outreach of world poverty. In other words, there are among the family of nations and in the nations of the world various segments of the community who refuse to serve and to work and who refuse to understand and who do not understand the modes of life which they see paraded before them and desire at the same time with all without of necessity putting forth human effort to reap a reward which they themselves have not merited. In this sense, of course, we support the elements of capitalism where capitalism seeks to create in man an awareness of responsibility. But we cannot support those aspects of capitalism which are oppressive to their brother and refuse to allow some measure of a corrective sort to be instituted in the world community to raise those levels of consciousness that are manifesting below the level of common decency even, and in other cases who are victims of themselves. We call to your attention then that strict and glaring honesty must be practiced by all mankind that they may be able to have compassion upon the world order and to see that there are self-corrective media within the world order. For many of the professors of the world who are inclined toward justice and fair play have also themselves concluded certain noble efforts of thought and feeling which if calculated and accepted by the masses of mankind would have produced in the world of cause and effect a greater manifestation of brotherliness and opportunity to mankind. We understand full well how that there are among the capitalist domains any number of individuals who are opposed to unionism. And we also understand how that among the union men there are those who are both in favor of unionism and opposed to it in the world order. Now the ascended masters do not support world political ideologies in most cases, but we do subscribe to those manifestations of justice among mankind which will produce opportunities of fair play to all peoples. And therefore it must be understood by the peoples of the world that the manifestation of unionism is neither good or bad, but it is the administration and the administration alone of those principles that seek negotiation with management that are either manifesting for good or ill. And they can be a means of great world good for the banding together of people 
opposing a way of life that seems to delete from them the bare necessities of life can often be productive of great good when those bonds are not misused or abused and turned into some form of political oppression which seeks to rob mankind of reality. This is what has actually taken place in the name of communism. For communism itself is not solely a communal effort, but it is in fact an activity that caters to the world's needs, but robs the world of its freedom. Its freedom to worship God, its freedom to think for itself and to bring into manifestation in the world order those creative and noble efforts which stem from attunement with the divine presence of life. Therefore, those who are bound by communist oppression may indeed outwardly appear to be making gains because their living conditions and standards are raised, but in reality they have sacrificed a great deal when they have lost the spiritual opportunity to express their God-oriented positive design that flowed forth in the beginning of the creation into manifestation, but has not been taken up by them and used because it is forbidden and not taught by their political system. You may wonder why I am discoursing upon this today, and I am doing it for a two-pronged reason. I am doing it to set straight in the minds and consciousness of people how that there are benign and kindly individuals manifesting on all sides of the iron and bamboo curtain. I am also doing it in order to call to the attention of those who live under the star of freedom that the banner which they enjoy and the opportunities of life which have come to them through the noble efforts of many guided by your own beloved Jesus and Saint Germain is indeed a prize of first dimension which all mankind ought to esteem most highly and seek to preserve for once it is lost I assure you that it will be a frightful condition that will bring about its restoration into manifestation. And the world today, because of politics and because of backstage politics, is often not supporting the way of truth and justice. I would call to your attention today that there are many individuals who fail to support the President of the United States in his bid for freedom to the people of the world. It is understandable that the mothers of the world and especially of those soldiers today who are engaged in mortal combat in Vietnam should also have a great antipathy toward war and a desire to see their sons restored to them. But simply to restore their sons to them at the cost of a great loss of freedom would in no way give to mankind and mass the freedom they seek. It is most regrettable that by force and force meeting force, freedom must be preserved in the world community for it is far more to be desired that the Prince of Peace, the Son of God, would go forth to war and make his bid for the spirits of mankind for their devotion toward cosmic principles and mass and therefore in response to his going forth that the people of the world would accept his riding forth and would hold with the great cosmic consciousness which he manifests and therefore world brotherhood would be a fait accompli. But because it is not so in the world domain and because mankind themselves are still embroiled in struggle, their consciousness being torn within itself, you can plainly see that that effort for freedom would manifest of necessity in an outer form, although we would far rather have it be a manifestation of the great tides of cosmic reality in their hearts. But the students of the light must learn to discern and to understand the great tides of cosmic reality which are within. They must understand that not by becoming ostriches with their heads in the sand and refusing to look honestly upon the world order can they perceive it as a thing apart from the divine presence of Almighty God. For his eyes that are too pure to behold the inequities of mankind are actually lifted up 
to behold new dimensions of wonder that he may convey to the creation which he has made. But this creation cannot receive the great blessings of that wonder, seeing that it does not yet even now enjoy the tremendous blessings which he has already made and created that men should enjoy here below in the world of form. And yet men are divided one from another, schisms being almost universal throughout the world order. And this prevents them from enjoying the fruit of cosmic effort and beneficence which God would long ago have bestowed upon the world order and would have done so from the day when Messiah came into manifestation 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem of Judea. I call then to your attention how that the struggles of the world in the outer cannot help but of necessity spill over into ascended master endeavors but it is not our desire to perpetuate them and we are anxious to see great walls of light erected not only between the activities of light but between the activities of individuals and the world order so that they can preserve those spiritual states of consciousness that will prevent them from becoming victims of their own spheres of darkness which abide in the continents of their being. They must reckon with those manifestations of dark and untransmuted substance and realize that until that substance is transmuted, the prince of this world will indeed come and find something within them to which he may attach himself and amplify, producing unrest in the very students of light who are intended by a divine decree to manifest in the world the burning and shining light of the eternal sun. Also, I call to your attention that the students of the light together with the ascended masters compose a veritable burning bush which can, by the power of the electronic energy of the divine presence, create out of men who were born to corruption incorruptible beings because there is a transmutative change in their consciousness and in their designs producing the fruit of reality. For they have erred. They have erred and fallen from the first estate, and it is now utterly necessary that they shall return to the first estate. But this means an abrogation of the second estate, the fallen estate of mankind, and a return to the pristine purity of the first estate, and the creation in the second estate of that which is in the first estate so that the middle wall of partition created between the immortal consciousness of Almighty God and the star of his appearing is torn down and there manifests in the world of cause and effects the beautiful radiance of the eternal, immortal, invincible, cosmic honor flame of the eternal one. I come to you then this day in the name of Almighty God to emphasize and amplify in the world of form the wisdom that ought to be within the heart and mind of every man whereby he could discern and strain out of the elements of manifestation within his life those elements which are of darkness and shadow and see that only pure light should be amplified in the domain of his consciousness. This is the production of the flame of illumination, the fanning of the flame of illumination into the pure Christ radiance of divine manifestation, whereby men put upon themselves the garments of the Son of God and walk in the world of form as total manifestations of him. Without this manifestation of him, they are a part divine and a part human. And the conflict that wages between the human and the divine must go on. And it is not instituted from the divine level, but it is instituted totally from the human level. And it is the human consciousness of mankind with his concepts that would take him where he wants to go that are in total conflict with the divine which will take him where he ought to go. And thus man, when he yields himself unto the spirit of Christ immortality, will find that there is an abiding presence within him that will help him to take a hold of himself and gird up the total manifestation of his being in such a manner that the cords of activity are directed by his will as it is united 
with the will of the eternal. In the word united, there is a certain hint and verbiage of tide, unitied. And I would call then to the attention of the students that this references the binding or the religio of the consciousness of God upon the consciousness of man and the binding of that immortal substance upon mortal substance will produce the transmuted effort which can be compared to the idea of Vulcan, the welding, as it were, of substance mortal to substance immortal and the fires of the immortal pouring forth and surging forth into the mortal to transmute, to change, and to weld all substance in divine order, allowing and permitting spaces in time and in space so that man can safely be escorted in an allegorical sense, as in the fable of the river Styx, across the pathway of death into the pathway of immortal life. Or there is in that concept of the river Styx, the river of death, a certain manifestation that reveals to those perceptive initiates how that unless man is wedded to God and that safely allowing spaces in his space and time in his time, a thing could come into manifestation prematurely as an atomic explosion and produce in the world of the spirit a completely destructive activity which would appear to be because it would come from divine energy to be a thing of light, but in reality would be a manifestation of destruction because of its prematurity. And therefore the students ought to understand how that God has appointed his rounds and his times but the time is always now for adoration, for attention to the presence, for recognition of the facts of life that are and for the facts of life that will be. Let it be clearly understood the manifestation of the beast that was, the beast that is and the beast that is to come. For this references the carnal nature of mankind, that which was being that which was in manifestation and is now transmuted that which is being that which is present with you as untransmuted substance and yet will be transmuted. The beast that shall be being that which shall be residual and untransmuted in days to come, but which will certainly also be transmuted so that the whole man may come no longer to the measurement of 666, but to 333 the three times three, creating the manifestation of the nine as the initiate pauses before the great eternal cycle of the one to return through the symbol of the number ten dex into manifestation that disseminates the human and produces out of it even as the earth produces out of the fruit of the mineral kingdom the manifestation of the flowers and fruits of the earth. So then man will spring forth as a flame flower, but as one divorced and apart from his carnal substance, he will produce by his own thoughts a pathway into the God magnificence of his being so that he no longer is dependent upon outer manifestation in form consciousness for his creativity or for his subsistence, but he draws directly from the universal, the energies of God, that produce the immortal flame within his consciousness. And as that flame blazes through the consciousness, it actually blazes into manifestation in the physical strata as well as the higher reaches of all parts of his being. And when all are united, there is the thread of unity tying the whole into one compacted package of universality. And that becomes then one with the ocean of almighty God's own precious being even as the shining dewdrop slips into the sea. This reality is the lot of every man who is not content to remain a creature bound to earthly ideas, to be committed to the sod as dust to dust, ashes to ashes, but has his goal and his eyes fixed upon that goal in the stars, in the star fire radiance, 
that sparks the germinal seed within every atom of substance and composes the thread of the infinite in finite manifestation. We who understand all that is and know the levers that propel mankind to such utter banality of thought and feeling whereby they construct in the world of form ditches in the sand which are washed out by the incoming tide, understand how that spiritual energies must be directed and man must do so willingly. They are prepared to study in the great universal systems of education in the world, but they are not prepared to study in the universities of the spirit. They are not prepared to surrender their banal thoughts even into the world of human limbo and put them aside for a moment while they pause to consider the reality of the spiritual thoughts. There are many today among mankind who are caught up and enamored in the idea how that when I was St. Francis I could speak to the birds of the air and communicate and they would fly in the form of the cross. Men are amazed at phenomena but they are never, in most cases, among the masses of mankind, amazed at the phenomena of spiritual communication. They are concerned with man's communication with the world kingdom, with the world order, but they seldom truly are concerned for the sake of the infinite with communication with the infinite. For the infinite also yearns and has within himself a yearning to communicate with the creation which he has made so that in that communication he may bestow the very best gifts upon mankind. But so long as mankind are content to abide in a state of satisfaction with food and shelter, with a reasonable security in the world order, the communal way of life, whether it be communism or capitalism or any other form of political ideology, is in itself but a half a loaf which in no way ought to content mankind with that half a loaf, for it defrauds them of their spiritual bread, the manna that came down from heaven, and it causes the religious march to become as book stalls, where mankind can for a farthing peruse the teachings of mankind, yet steeped in the banal aspects of life, and not themselves free thereof. We, the ascended masters, are free, free by divine right, free by the power of the angels, free by the power of the Godhead, free by the power, the power infinite from the heart of the great central sun, free for all eternity in time and in space, free also in form, in cause and effect, in karma and in all things that man may think or do, we are free. And we long to bestow that freedom upon those noble chilas of the light, those disciples of cosmic effort and of the ascended masters who will hold our hands faithfully as they walk day by day down the avenue of the years and understand that at the end thereof there is not only the proverbial pot at the end of the rainbow which we prefer to call potential but there is also the reward of communication with the Divine One who himself has both impersonality and person. Person like unto thy own person and impersonality like unto the impersonal bond that welds all hearts as one. We therefore speak to the world order today for complacency, no. For activity, yes, that men may see that wisdom and her children are best nourished by a philosophy of action, are best taught by a philosophy of movement, are therefore endowed not necessarily with the greatest wisdom through contemplation, but through activity. And that activity can manifest so beautifully in the decree patterns which the students of the light are engaged in. And there is a very definite activity in the world of form promoted by the psychics of the world, those children of darkness who have lost contact with the great power of the cosmic Christ, whereby they seek to bring into disrepute the manifestation of vocalized decrees and dynamic decreeing. We say for all to hear that never in times past nor in the present age 
has anything resembling the tremendous power of decrees as your own beloved St. Germain and Godfrey, as your own beloved Jesus and others of the great white brotherhood have instituted as a means whereby you can cut across the machinations and force fields of human thought and feeling and demonstrate a freedom in the world order that is scientific and sound and without discord. We pray, therefore, that you will let no stone be unturned nor moss grow underneath your feet to declare to the world and do it valiantly, confidently, and by the radiant power of the light that decrees such as was long ago spoken of, thou shalt decree a thing, and it shall be established unto thee are a ascended master function. When rightly used and employed, they are productive of phenomenal good in the world of form and the world of the individual. And therefore we hasten to employ every power of the infinite in the world order so that man may the sooner find his freedom and his unity with the shining sea of God reality, the fount of wisdom from whence cometh the strength of our mind and the strength of the mind of every son of God ascended or unascended. I thank and nights of rest. May the peace of your presence keep you blessed. Sign of the heart, of the head, and the hand of you. May the eternal brotherhood of light surround you now with the wisdom of Kathumi and Jesus as you go forth to practice that which the masters have preached. Precious ones of east and west, as the sunlight falling upon falling water creates 
diamonds of bright radiance in the air. So does the ascended Jesus Christ consciousness provide an extraordinary conveyance of the brilliance of God into the waiting chalice of the mind. Yet, men must understand out of merciful understanding how that consciousness with its variegated motif can be a veritable kaleidoscope of strange ideas that are in no way the tangible manifestation of the beauty of God. Men have asked for an accounting concerning the world order. The world order is but a reflection of the consciousness of men. As they think, so is the world order. And then comes the manifold requests, storming the gates of heaven and urging upon the deity a change in the world condition. For the world perceives, even in the dimness of a relative unknowing, that all goes not well with mortal affairs. These storms of human petitions beamed heavenward by man's consciousness are heard. But the change that must be wrought in the world must be a change in consciousness. That which is known as sophistry has great wisdom in the world as wit, as human cleverness must give way to the childlike innocence of acceptance of the consciousness of God. Little do men dream of pursuing a fount of wisdom, how that the all wisdom of God is in no way clad with garments of outer cleverness or the desire to outwit mankind. Think ye not that the God of the universe, with his vast creative knowledge, would have been put to the test and have failed? Think ye that if God had desired to interfere with the free will of man, that the omnipotence of God could not have executed his design in the world long ago? Surely, O mankind, you who have that faith within understand that it is only the will of God to manifest the fiats of immortal perfection. And thus, God does not enter into the contest between human wills, between human ideologies. The variegated opinions of men their manifold ideas in conflict with one another do not interfere with the plan of the Most High in those reaches of cosmic beauty where divine design plans immortal glory for all his kingdom. Nay, they but interfere in the realm of human consciousness. And it is human consciousness that has wrought such destruction in the world of form and torn asunder heart from heart again and again, preventing the manifestation of the infinite capacity of divine love to expand itself through all of the creation 
and perform those beautiful acts which will presage the coming of the golden age at inner levels. But you see, precious ones, just as individuals today with their mortal consciousness are not able to tune in to radio and television systems without a mortal instrument to effect that attunement, so there are many individuals who are unable to reach up into the reality of God and to sense that reality. They are so immersed in the consciousness of the mundane, in the old and familiar, that they seldom are able to long hold any degree of attunement with the higher octaves of light. Some ask the question, why do individuals who profess to follow the divine plan, fail to attend the many services of light that are held here? Why do they not recognize the greatness of the ascended master's radiance, of the attunement with the great white brotherhood and the rare privilege of receiving the necessary communications which are beamed forth periodically and rhythmically to those blessed ones in attendance here. The question is never answered correctly by the carnal mind, but can only be understood from the ascended master's level. It is simply a lack of devotion on the part of mankind to those ideals which they profess to adhere to and a lack of realization of the splendid moments that come to them when the ascended masters pour out the ungans of their love to all who hear. But we perceive that hearing they hear not and seeing they see not, for their minds are dulled to the violet radiation of mercy that comes forth and drops gentle mercy upon all beneath. They do not feel or sense the reality of the violet transmuting flame. To them it is but a mechanical contrivance or a manifestation that they do not understand. Let men then today, even those with dull wits, understand that the mighty Hercules, the Elohim of the first ray, has agreed this day to lend to me his mighty cosmic energy of first ray power, that as I speak, mankind might feel in my message of mercy the freeing power that as an acetylene torch cuts through the strange ideas that have bound mankind to sense consciousness and causes them to reach up in mercy's name to perceive the reality of God blazing in all of its cosmic glory. The reality of God is for all. The reality of God in mercy's name is for the world. It is to create new orders of beauty among men and new states of consciousness that will be as refreshing as a cool mountain stream or a marvelous sea breeze. Let men then welcome the fresh winds of cosmic freedom born from our hearts with the fullness of the great love tides that come forth from the mind of God. For the mind of God is no unreal thing. The mind of God is the only sparkling, tangible manifestation of reality that has any meaning for it exists. It is, and it has the power to perpetuate itself and to immortalize those who immerse themselves in its stream. This is the water of life that those who thirst of may drink, and in mercy's name when they drink of it, truly drink of it, 
they shall never thirst again for it involves the involvement of complete and total identity with the Godhead. It involves that sweetest and most solemn moment of surrender when the soul is caressed by the Holy Spirit and becomes one with God. Today, the world order is as it is because the mind is involved in the mundane, in the sand and rock crystals, in the chemical composition of matter, in the substance of nature manifesting as primal material, trees and growing things in the fields, and all that produces the fruit of the earth unto mankind. The hills with their ageless splendor today are still enjoyed by those who drink at the fount of nature, but they do not sense the reality of God that has created them and are rather concerned with civilizations, with kingdoms, with powers temporal and with the powers of the church temporal as well and far more than the church triumphant and eternal. Let us then today speaking out of the great fount of illumination and mercy from our octave of light hasten to assure all that it is God's desire to enlighten men, to inspire men and to direct men in a course that will school their consciousness to higher things until the divine essence can be cognized even as a separator on a farm. Blessed ones does separate the cream from the skimmed milk. Men must recognize that the power to discern is within themselves and if it be not there must be invoked they must understand and do the necessary things that will help them to unfold their latent divinity. For God himself can but provide the avenues of service whereby their minds and beings can be schooled and directed into the Christ consciousness with its transcendental rays that will perform for all men the marvelous experience of liberation to the individual monad, freeing the minds then from concepts of mortality. The immortal is perceived at first afar and men but dimly cognize it. Then as they draw near again and again to drink of that fount, it will come to pass that the fount of illumination and of mercy and all of the splendid outpourings of divinity will wash their individual consciousness and cleanse them from those mortal shrouds that have actually obscured the great light and enable them perforce to see in mercy's name behind the veil to pierce that strong membrane which they have made that continually rejects their attempts to penetrate it even as a trampoline thrusts up the bodies of those who jump upon it. Let men understand that they should develop by constancy of coming to the fount of God and drinking a definite rhythmic service to the light so that the light will know that at a given time they will be there in their rightful places, keeping the vigil for the light and enabling the planning committee of the great white brotherhood, for we have such a committee, to count on the fact that when we desire to effect a certain release of knowledge into the student body, that it will reach those for whom it is intended as well as all to provide blessings from on high and power to cut oneself free from all entanglements that are not of the light. 
Now, as I said it, I mused upon that statement of my own, even as I was saying it, for I realized that there are entanglements of the light, that God himself is a most fascinating lover of mankind who pours out from his own stream of consciousness the great mysteries of his being and involves the consciousness of mankind in it to such a degree as time passes that they can never again be content without contact with the great divine lover, the eternal God. Today, throughout the world, there are many individuals who are actually precious ones torn apart literally by the world order. Their souls are so wounded by the effects of mankind's states of consciousness upon them that they no longer desire to even be in life. And every year, a certain percentage of those who exit from the stage of life via the awful path of suicide do so because life to them seems to lack any meaning. I would call to your attention today that these poor souls are not able to have the teachings of the ascended masters. And if they are vouchsafed to them, they do not stay or linger long enough and seek deeply enough until they find the goal that is so beautifully hidden within reach of every individual who will be constant. I then say to you today in mercy's name that constancy is one of the most magnificent qualities that mankind can develop and yet it is a quality in which many are lacking. There is a restlessness in mankind that causes them to feel a need to pursue one course of pleasure seeking for a moment then to abandon it almost with reckless abandon and seek for another course even while they are almost in the act of initiating the first one they turn from one bauble and trinket of consciousness or pleasure concept to another and they are never truly satisfied long by that which they have. Yet, in matters of religion, it has been a deliberate act on the part of the brothers of the shadow, the black brotherhoods and the sinister force, to create concerning religion itself a sort of obscuring shroud of consciousness that will cause men to recoil from spiritual things so that they will thus be caught in the jaws of the trap of nihilism on one hand and sensualism on the other. When nihilism seems to be a frightful thing to them, they reject it and they turn to sensualism. And when sensualism seems to be an overpowering passion of non-satisfaction, they sometimes turn to nihilism and therefore divinity is completely left away from their consciousness. They pursue it not, and they flee it if it comes nigh them. Thus, in mercy's name, I point this out to all so that they will understand that it is God's desire to gather into the fold of his heart every life stream, for every life stream bears the signet of his touch, and there is no lump of clay so muddied in contempt that God does not yet perceive in it the remnant of himself, the seed of his own blighted hopes now in man, because man has not accepted the tenderness of his touch and has rejected his magnificence. It is for them blighted, not blighted in the consciousness of God, for he still holds that self-same love for oneness for all. And even the bright shining 
magnificent souls that have gone into higher octaves of light and attained their liberation, they who walk in robes of white and share in the administration of his kingdom, these are no compensation for him, for he sees even in the dullest and dimmest individual that little minute spark of his own reality shining down beneath the obscuring surface and God desires to see that released and all the slime of mortal consciousness transmuted by that transcendent light as it expands as a miniature sun within the consciousness of that individual. God does not desire as some men have conceived to see brought about a mere punishment of the wicked but he desires to see the consciousness of wickedness itself cast into the violet transmuting flame committed to the eternal fires that they may once again be released from the overpowering substance of mortal illusion. God desires freedom for the world for he created the world in freedom and mercy is always within his hand. Yet, the karmic board acting under divine direction are from time to time compelled by cosmic law and the law of the cycles to produce in the world of individuals a return of the awful karma which they have long created in the workings of the darkness of their own mind. And because those individuals are then brought to judgment, individuals other than they will say, how could this terrible, frightful thing have happened unto them? I tell you all that there is no thing that happens unto mankind in the mainstream that is not the result of their own returning karma. Not necessarily a karma caught from day to day in the mills of God and returned, but one that sometimes grinds through the ages and is returned only under the most propitious or compelling circumstances, as the case may be. But today, in the name of mercy, we speak of the divine outpouring of God's mercy toward the world that would take the darkest soul and bring that soul to the light. But there must exist in the soul response. Without response, without soul hunger, without desire for Christ's magnificence, without faith in the reality of God, there can be no current created and generated within the self that will permit God to pass through. The ring pass not that surrounds every individual sacred domain. For man must understand Stand and understand well that he has the power to exclude God from his world as expansion. He can remain in a strata of knowledge far from the light. He can remain fixed in a state of delusion. He can remain even contrite, but until he opens the door willingly to progress God cannot produce the acts of mercy which he desires to do man must surrender by free will to God this is the law yet men are held in bondage to one another to lesser beings by far than the eternal one embodied men as well as disembodied spirits from time to time do take command of those individuals who do not understand how to set up the necessary safeguards in consciousness that will hold them by divine love to their own beloved God presence with its supreme reality of consciousness. Let men perceive then that the safest way through a sea of human troubles 
and a return to the merciful arms of God is always effected because the soul understands as a sobbing child understands innately that when it returns to God, the clasp of comfort will be applied to the heart of the individual. That after the comfort is given, wisdom will be imparted. That after wisdom is given, responsibility will be conveyed. That when responsibility is conveyed to one individual, it means that that individual is expected to return in mercy's name to the arena of life and to conduct his affairs in such a manner as will do honor to the God of comfort who received him. It is not God's will to merely play nursemaid, blessed ones, to mankind again and again to bind up their human hurts and their wounded egos, their consciousness, and the various states in which they find themselves and then have those individuals rush forth into the pleasure marts of the world and seek there among the hog troughs the swill that mankind are dispensing in the world of form as reality. God expects men to enlist themselves, quite frankly, as soldiers of the cross, but not of the world sense of the cross, but of the cross between God and man, the cross between the emerging embryonic individual and the eternal concept of God made in the semblance of righteousness because it is the righteousness of immortal life. Made in his image, men are expected to conduct themselves in mercy's name, in his image. What does it mean to conduct oneself in the image of God? It means that the image of God is a tangible, electric, electronic energy, an essence, a pure, tangible manifestation of light substance that mankind can permit to flow through them, that the conducting of that energy into the force field of their individual selves will change their individual selves by the shining reality of God and cause them to walk in the light even as he is in the light. I have stood and I have consulted with your beloved Jesus again and again. I have consulted with Saint Germain. I have consulted with all of the beloved brothers in white who work for the freedom of this age. We have discussed all of the many facets of mortal consciousness and how we could better serve the needs of both God and man in the producing of freedom in this age in mercy's name. And all that we have thought to do and have executed has been done for the glory of God in man. But man still has the supreme right of the freedom of the will and as they think so they become but because they think thoughts of bondage thoughts of resentment and rebellion against one another because they think in terms of grandiose expressions rather than the nobility of God They continue to put themselves into bondage to old orders that they were in the past connected with, orders of consciousness, orders of thought, orders of group consciousness. All of these situations are brought about and produced because mankind do not connect with the reality of God, do not hold their attention upon God, do not produce the flame of constancy in their service and continue to attend every opportunity they get those special services when our radiation and love is poured forth. They do not produce the flame, the burning flame within themselves of decrees in action, invocations of the sacred fire for the sake of their freedom and the freedom of man and thus their karma is not enhanced in a constructive manner 
and they continue to go down into the thraldom of the senses and produce these experiences which border on the unhappy and profane. Now in mercy's name, as a flower would nod in the breeze, so do I desire the gentleness of the folds of my consciousness. But above all, the gentleness of the folds of God's consciousness of mercy to assuage in you all hurt, all agony of soul, to bring you the same comfort that the beloved angel, holy amethyst, brought unto Christ in Gethsemane to show you the way then after the moment of comfort has come to go forth with dry eyes into the world arena and to see God everywhere, wasting no energy in condemnation of others, but letting all energy flow in gratitude to the heart of your presence, you will even produce the transparency in consciousness which will ultimate in the light showing through your flesh form so that even outer mankind can ultimately perceive it. And the light that is within you will be a city that is set up on a hill that cannot be hid. And in mercy's name it is needed today as it has never been needed since the world was born. As it has never been needed since you were born or since first a human took occupation of this blessed sphere. May we ask you to draw near to the sense of the garden of God, to the sense of the paradise of pure consciousness, to the tender reality that man cannot know because he is ever and anon caught up in mortal doings and thinking. When you come into God's consciousness, it is because you are familiar with its nature, because you love it first when it seems to scourge your flesh and being, because you love it first when all your impulse is to fly and flee from God's delight, because you love it first when the night with its shining baubles and trinkets of consciousness presents a greater allure, but you love it first. You keep the flame of your constancy and attention upon it until the night is far spent, until the dawn of beauty and perfection comes easily to the consciousness. Then God can make himself known to you. And you will know even as you are known by God. And when his fingers caress the anomalies of your being, you will say, see, Father, here is a hurt, a spot that needs correction. Touch it here and make it well. And it will be well. For you will have the faith to know and to produce the miracle in consciousness that is the requirement of every hour to produce God in the world and in society and in nature and the harmony of the spheres singing together will produce the paradise on earth that was Eden and transcends it. Music beyond that known on earth will be heard by your inner ears and ultimate also in the resounding of physical, tangible manifestation that will make the world a fairy land of cosmic delight where the beauty of God will be seen in the eyes of the young and of the old and mercy will bring such delight to the world that there will be no more any night here. No more any night in your consciousness.
head and the hand to you. May the peace of your presence abide with you. Wherever you are, wherever you go, may the glorious peace from your presence flow. Through days of service and nights of rest, may the peace from your presence keep you blessed. The sign of the heart and the head and the hand to you. May faith and hope and charity abide with you always.